now go on to my talk on um, early blood challenges. Uh, we all understand that even after a very successful strabiculectomy, uh, attention to detail in the post-op period is very critical and we need to be very wary of some of these telltale signs. So essentially the common blood challenges could be an early blood failure and if you nip it in the bud, we could have salvaged the trabeculectomy procedure. A blood leak, again, it could lead on to hypotony if it is not looked into early enough. And early blebitis, it could be dealt with early on. And of course, problems due to a large bleb. So it is all about how do you do your containment procedures. So for that, you need to understand the risk factors in that particular eye, have the ability to recognize those early risk factors, identify the cause, and prevent failure and restore function. So when we talk of risk factors, it could be young age and aggress aggressive healers in the young, a secondary glaucoma more so to a neovascular glaucoma or an inflammatory UVIT glaucoma or an anterior chamber dysgenesis. Inflammation could be as trivial as a conjunctival inflammation or a lid inflammation or a patient who's got chronically inflamed eye because of anti-glaucoma drops over years. These could be a hazardous to a bleb uh, success. Again, a previous surgery, something as trivial as a pterygium surgery or a previous SICS or a, or a retinal buckle, Afro-Asian descent. If the punch is too anterior, it could have a valvular effect that if you do a massage, you get the fluid flowing in, but otherwise the bleb is flat. Or if it is a very posterior punch, again, you would find that uh, there is a closure which is happening. If it is a subconjunctival hemorrhage, then again, the presence of fibrin and blood pigments would be definitely hazardous to the success of the bleb. You then need to look into the etiology. Is the blockage at the level of internal ostium or is it at juxtascleral, at the scleral flap edge? Now that is something which can be picked up easily when you do a gonio. And you need to keep this mind, especially when you're doing a needling in these eyes, because you need to know that the flap is adherent at the scleral flap uh, margin, and you need to enter that. If it could be a regular subconjunctival fibrosis or a mitomycin toxicity with a conjunctival necrosis or a blood leak or a conjunctival uh, retraction. We need to be understand the wound healing after trabeculectomy. It is largely in four phases. The coagulative phase is, is, is rather during the course of the surgery or immediately after that, where you need to catch these bleeders, you adrenaline soak sponges or do a very gentle pottery. And then you go on to the inflammatory phase in the immediate post-op where it's absolutely mandatory to increase the frequency of the topical steroid drops. The role of wound modulators are less here. Then you go on to the proliferative phase wherein you need to keep them on topical steroid drops, but the mod wound modulating agents do come in. And if there is a challenge for the bleb, you need to use these at this point of time, a 5-FU or a mitomycin. And then going on to the remodeling phase, which goes on to months. Actually, the epithelium, whether it's a functioning or a flab, uh, failed bleb, the epithelium looks similar. But when you look uh, in the sub-epithelial tissue, it's loosely arranged with clear spaces in a good bleb. And it, there's dense collagen tissue with no spaces in a, uh, a bleb which is fibrosed. An ideal bleb would have microsis. There would be paucity of vessels overlying the bleb and you could compare it when you see the nasal and the temporal conjunctiva. There would be a diffuse drainage and a moderate elevation. In fact, IOP is going to be the surrogate measure and of course the appearance of the bleb help. And if you could lift the bleb on digital massage, that clues you on that the bleb is doing good and the non-invasive anterior segment OCT gives information. So a good bleb is one if the IOP is less than 14 without the AGM. If it is 14 to 18, it's a moderate bleb. But if it is more than 18, it's not a good functioning bleb. But then we also need to keep in mind at this point of time, whether the pressure at the beginning of the surgery was in 50s. And we all know that the trabeculectomy procedure just give, brings about a 30% uh, IOP drop. So in that particular case, maybe an 18 is also a successful surgeon. So then you need to look at the signs of a bleb failure. So essentially it would be a low or a flat bleb, highly vascularized as this, no microsis, quite opalescent, and you might even see a fibrotic vascular ring surrounding it. You would have an internal block possibly, and you would suddenly see that the IOP is rising. And more importantly, the bleb would not lift on massage. And gonioscopically, you would be able to make out that the scleral flap is adherent, which is indicative of a juxta uh, scleral fibrosis. Again, if you look in the ostium at during gonio, you would know that the iris is plugging, or is it vitreous, or it is blood or fibrin. 
The tenon cyst actually starts off with a nice raised bleb with good filtration, but then suddenly it becomes quite smooth domed. There are large vessels. The sclerostomy is patent, but there are no microcysts. And you might try using uh, aqueous suppressants in initially to bring down the filtration, but you could even try anti-inflammatory, but finally needling is what we need. The bleb can be graded as I've labeled out all these different ways, but I felt that the Indiana bleb grading is the best in the sense it clearly identifies a flat bleb based on the height. It tells you the, by clock hour basis, whether the bleb, how much the bleb is extensive, it tells you on the vascularity of, vascularity of the bleb and you could actually classify the blebs accordingly. OCT and UVM are also helpful in bleb imaging, a multi-form wall, a subconjunctival separation or a hyporeflective wall are indicative that this bleb is functioning. So then the next question is, how do you prevent bleb failure? As was earlier alluded to, you need to stop the topical anti-glaucoma medication, preferably if you can in that scenario by for a week, stop the blood thinners, treat the conjunctival and the lid inflammation. You could start preoperative topical steroid drops a week before, do a atraumatic surgery and post-op. Ensure that you are liberal with your anti-inflammatory drops, the wound modulating agents. You need to ensure that there is aqueous filtration happening and be prepared to use topical steroids for three to six months as it is in your hands. Again, if the filtration is not good, the IOP is going up, you should use your releasable sutures of releasing it, sometimes very rarely in a, within a week, but largely in the second or third week. If you have interrupted sutures, you could do suture lysis, one suture at a time, and you could even in an hour's interval, you could remove the other suture. But then when the IOP is going up, besides the suture release, you need to be very aggressive on your anti-inflammatory agents. You should be prepared to use your 5-FU liberally. MMC drops could be used and needling is something you should be prepared to do even if it is in the early post-op period. Again, if it is a suture release with laser, you could use a lens without magnification, which press it on the conjunctiva, blanch it, and you are able to visualize a suture and cut it. You could use a mag without magnification or with magnification. Then comes how do you manage the internal ostium block? So you need to identify the etiology on gonioscopy. So if it's just a, a uh, fibrin or a blood clot, you could try intracameral tissue plasminogen, but these are costly. But if it is iris which is blocking, you could go into a side port and release the iris. You could do a vitrectomy if vitreous is blocking, or in a situation you have to do an internal bleb revision. Now, if it is a tenon cyst, then it largely needs a bleb revision. And first, you there are different studies like one Ferrer et al. Uh, uh, talked about as, as incising the subconjunctal scar tissue. Pedersen and Smith talked about needling and their success rate. Ewing and Stamper talked about five few injections along with needling and they claimed to have 91.6% success rate. Shin et al. believed in just giving one injection of five few during needling. And then Mardell et al. talked about a slit lamp usage. So when you do needling, uh, what you need to remember is besides actually, I prefer to give three to seven injections of IEPU in the post-operative period, along with early topical steroid drops, which I would taper over six weeks and a digital massage I would also do in the post-op period if indicated. So first I would balloon up the conjunctiva with the injection of xylocaine with adrenaline. And with my 26 gauge needle tip, I would cut the subconjunctival fibrosis and the way the conjunctiva balloons up, it is indicative that you are separated the subconjunctival fibrosis. And I would ensure that I go comfortably and slowly all the way overlying the bleb area. And then I would go deeper to the bleb. Once I've ensured that the subconjunctival fibrosis has been taken care of, go under the bleb and continue the cutting process and go right up to the ostium. And after that, what I would do is I would go ahead and see that the, and I would reform the anterior chamber with air bubble, and then also I would give a five FU injection away from the bleb. So going further, if this was a case which I'm not, uh, would uh, just like to show you, sorry. This is a case wherein the iris was blocking. So I would create a paracentesis and with a blunt spatula first release the iris. But then I can't stop with this because the bleb is already flat and needling has to be done. So, but without doing an internal ostium opening, it makes no sense. And then after doing that, I would go on to doing my needling of the bleb as I had shown you in my earlier case. But this is a situation wherein there's an epithelial defect and going on to a stromal melt. 
So although this case demands needling the angry looking blab, I would have to treat the cornea, I would have to use uh, bandage contact lens, lot of lubricants, then once the eye settles, then only I could go in and needle this blab. The other challenge is a hypotony. It could be something as basic as a small black bleak, which was no, unnoticed, an overfiltering blab, a hyposecretion, a ciliary body shutdown, a cyclodiasis cleft, or an effusion. So what is most important is I need to paint the bed to locate where is the leak, and this non-stain aqueous leaking out, as in this case, would tell you that there is a bleb leak. And this was a particular case which had a thin uh, flap and uh, uh, some amount of conjunctival necrosis had set in. So the management of leaky blood, what is essential, it has been absolutely atraumatic surgery. It is said to be more common in fornix-based flats, but what is the challenge is it could lead on to end off unnoticed. You could have a flat AC, and if it is something far away and a large um, uh, blood leak, you need to suture it up and reform the AC. But if there's a small leak, you could do with a BCL, and you should leave the BCL for two to four weeks. This is a beautiful uh, journal of glaucoma uh, flow chart, which tells you that if you have an early bleed, bleb leak, you need to look at the distance of the leak from the limbus and evaluate the anterior chamber status. If the anterior chamber is shallow, you need to go and suture it. But if the anterior chamber is deep, and if the bleb leak is less than two millimeters, you could use your bandage contact lens of 15.5 millimeters. But if it is two to four, then I would use a larger uh, BCL. But if it is not closing, I would look at suturing beyond waiting two weeks. So this is how a bleb leak was there and a bandage contact lens was placed and the anterior chamber improved. The other challenge early on is an overfiltering bleb. So the, you would easily pick it up because intraocular pressure is low, but the anterior chamber is shallow and you do not want a structural or functional damage. So if it's grade one depth, I would do conservative management, maybe an autologous blood. I would do a gonio, UBM, ASOCT. But if it is a grade two bleb, and overfiltering bleb, I would, again, if it's grade one, I could even probably taper my steroid drops. But if it is grade two, I need to reform it with air or C3F8 gas. And if it's grade three, I have to go back and re-suture the flap edges. Ologen has its claims that it sort of regulates the aqueous filtration, but we do not want a hypotony. But if hypotony is going to set in, it brings about a breakdown of the blood ocular barrier. And then in the early stages, maybe you would do frequent tropical steroid drops, treat the leak. Then you need to sometimes step onto the oral steroid drops. And then it comes to a point that really you would, when it's kissing choroidals, you just cannot sit. So then you need to actually first look at the bleb, whether the sutures have come off, whether you need to put more sutures, you could, but you need to keep reforming the AC at all times. And this particular case, we had to suture the bleb. But even after suturing the bleb, what we noticed was that the anterior chamber was not reforming. So then we had to go in and raise a scleral flap and then go on making incisions from the choroid till there is that gush of uh, straw colored yellow fluid which came in. And then I wouldn't suture this flap, I would reform the AC and then close the conjunctiva and deal with that moment. Taking you further, that the last extreme, like this is a thin cystic bleb. So then what is necessary for us to remember that we need to do a thorough mitomycin wash. You should place your pledgets right in the posterior space and so that it doesn't come to touch the conjunctival margins. And you need to be sure you're using the right concentration. But if you have this kind of a bleb, you could use oral doxy, you could use vitamin C, but remember that you could even try a modified cornix based flap wherein there's a frill of conjunctiva, which sort of would prevent that kind of a scenario. The last segment is the bleb-related infection or the bleb-related endophthalmitis. The percentage of occurrence in the different studies have been less, but it's more seen if you have ignored a bleb leak or you have used excess of metabolites or a medial or an inferior bleb and many more, but you could actually look at that, that telltale condition of the bleb, that minimal anterior chamber reaction. If you do not treat it now, it's going to rapidly progress. So you have to be conscious, look for those risk factors, culture the bleb discharge and start them on fortified antibiotics and please involve your vitreal retinal colleague and be prepared that this trap would fail. So there's so much which needs to be washed when you're doing an early uh, uh, post-operative period. So I would go back to my second slide and say that we need to understand the risk factors, have the ability to recognize those early telltale signs, identify the cause and prevent the failure because it's not just the anatomical success but also the visual function
which has to be restored at all times. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Chitra, for the beautiful overview of 